Welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Larry Correa and Steve Diamond. And uh, after our uh, freewheeling discussion on free speech and Russia, Ukraine and Twitter and all, all sorts of fun stuff, uh, we're going to now talk about stuff that's even more fun, which is the, the book that you both released uh, about a month ago. So, all right. I think you guys launched the same time that Weird World War Four launched. Yeah, about five, five, six weeks, I think. Yeah, it was right yeah. at the beginning of March. Yeah, so, something like that. So, so let's let's talk about uh, servants of war a little bit, and then like we'll delve into writing and and, and various topics as as it as it flows by. But uh, tell like tell the audience a little bit about what's the central pre- premise behind servants of war, and why is it uh, disturbingly like the uh, current situation. <laughs> We just we just talked about in the last episode. Well, I mentioned I think our timing was impeccable in that we wrote a a dark fantasy novel about a war in a world that's based on Slavic folklore, uh, where we have a giant uh, uh, empire invading, you know, and having a giant trench warfare uh, war against all these other little pseudo Slavic nations. And uh, that came out the same week World War Three started, so our timing was impeccable. We, except to be fair, though, our characters don't work for the good guys. If you read this book, it's very clear that they work for a bunch of huge things. <laughs> oh, so who do they work for? Like, who? what's the... Because uh, it's it's not Russia, per se, but it's like a, a yeah. Russian is, sort of... Yeah. Uh, so this is a fantasy world, but basically we, we drew heavily from Slavic mythology. So what it is, is this is the world that's the, where the fairy tales come from in our world. And uh, the the fairy tale things would wander into our world and could go back, whereas humans would wander you know through the mists and wind up in this world, and they would stay, yeah. and they were stuck there. So basically, over thousands of years, mankind kind of colonized this connected world uh, and drove the fairy tale monsters back. And so the every group of people that me and Steve have in this universe are descended from groups uh, that are lost from Earth. Uh, and so they have right. this kind of giant empire now that's based loosely on all these different groups from Eastern Europe. And so we have mm-hmm. the, the one in charge, the, the, uh, or basically the, 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 we call them the Kolokovians or the not Russians. Um, uh, the, the prize of this war is basically people that are descended from the Czech Republic or, or the Czechia um, and the Czechs. And then uh, they're fighting the Almatians, which are further west. And so they're Germanic and Teutonic. Uh, and so that's basically the, the, the power struggle that was between Almatia and Kolokovia, this great big war. And, uh, well, that was a really convoluted pitch. <laughs> well, no, we got to, I mean, well, we, we only have, we have as, me, as much time as you have. <laughs> Let's just yeah. say. You know, in, in general, trench warfare, dark fantasy, um, where the main character pilots a suit made out of the husks of dead golems. And so he's struggling to deal with surviving a super awful, horrible trench warfare war that's been going on for 100 years, um, while also trying not to let a goddess who has kind of sort of chosen him, trying not to let that goddess also kill him. So, yeah, in it's, general, uh, that's what it is. 1917 meets the Witcher. Yeah. In, in flavor. OK. And and so they're fighting the Almatians, but how, how are kind of the the um supernatural you know fairies and entities and things like that how do they mix into all this oh man okay so this is where so i'm best known as a fantasy author right uh and so an action adventure for this book i teamed up with steve who's a horror author steve's background is horror um it's dark fairy tale magic so this is not yeah this is not happy fun you know, this is not happy, fun Keebler elves. These are the old school, you know, kidnap your baby elves. No, they're not like trailer park elves. They're different. Oh, no, no. These no, are not no. trailer park elves. These are no. these are the old, old, old dark things from the forest. Uh, look, so the story opens basically like way out in the middle of nowhere. Our main character is a farm kid. He works at the family mill. Uh, and the opening scene is his, and this is not really spoilers because this is like right on the back cover. This is uh, chapter his, one. Yeah, chapter one. His village gets slaughtered by by these uh, you know otherworldly things, and he blames himself for this because he he's 21 years old. He should have been you know serving in the army, 
Uh, but he just kind of had, he had not because you know, he had a good life. They're on the edge of the empire. They're so far out that they haven't even seen a tax collector for a decade. They're forgotten. You know, they're forgotten people out in the middle of the snowy woods. Well, this horrible thing happens. Like every young man is supposed to have served in the military and he didn't do so. So he blames himself for the destruction of his village. Uh, basically, an ancient forest goddess comes along and condemns him <laughs> for shirking his duty. And he gets drafted basically because of this. Yeah. And uh, that's how the story starts. And uh, it just kind of spirals from there. It, uh, it, it it's it's a good story. Our reviews on this are awesome. Um, yeah, it, it it's dark. It's it, for people who read a lot of my books. It's, it's way darker than most of my stuff because mm -hmm. I teamed up with Steve. Yeah, when when we were writing it and we were sending the book to everybody for uh, for a little bit of feedback or whatever, or we were sending it off so the cover artist could could do some stuff. It, it was always like Larry was sending it off and he'd say, "Okay, here's the new book." By the way, <laughs> so you know, this is really dark because I wrote this with Steve and Steve is really dark. It was like this huge like caveat every time he sent it out. I just laughed. I thought it was hilarious. He had, um, well, some we had, we had, uh, we brought in various people from the cultures, you know, that, that you know, we use Nikki yeah. Kenyon a lot. Uh, if you guys know Nikki. Uh, so she actually grew up, uh, or she's from the Ukraine. She grew up in Lviv. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how you say it, and uh, and so she was our our kind of Slavic cultural uh, uh, expert, and then uh, we actually have one of the lost tribes of Israel had wound up on this side of the veil, and uh, so Michael Rothman was our uh, consultant to make sure that all our our Jewish character was uh, authentic, which is funny because I had one reviewer who was like, he's like, wow, this Jewish guy kind of had of a whole bunch of rabbi stereotypes about him and i'm like hey don't take that up with me you take that up with michael roth <laughs> yeah <That's>, bus michael rothman <laughs> like i'm i'm shoveling off on, off on my consultant of judea judaism you know you're gonna go talk to mike you're gonna go yell at him you know yeah. um, well you're gonna get that no matter what right oh it's yeah, just totally. like yeah well you know we a lot of the reviews when, when they talk about a lot of this stuff or they talk about kind of the overall tone of the book they 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 either go they go one of two ways. They're like, ooh, boy, and and the majority go this way. They're like, ooh, yeah, this is pretty dark. I mean, it's great, and I couldn't stop reading, but man, it's pretty dark. And then there's the other guy who says, man, you know what? This just wasn't dark enough. I mean, there were not enough rats eating people in the trenches. Yeah, that like how actually... did, how could you not include that in the book? And I'm like, like give me a minute, guys. I mean, <laughs> like. Like I, yeah. I, I can only we can only have so much unrelenting horror in one book. I mean, that's what sequels are for. Yeah. So, so actually, that's what. So, ever since I mean, Steve referred to that as the at the rats eating people meter, and we could turn the rats eating people meter up and down. <laughs> yep. You're just I mean, yeah, right yeah, now I mean, we're at about a seven. <laughs> I mean, all you need to do is just like look at Bucha and you'll get plenty of ideas for crisis. I mean, it's well, like, I know that's the thing is like our timing, like I said, our timing is horrific on this, you know. Uh, I don't, I guess just because because the real world catches up, you know, and people yeah. forget, people forget like, like what a sheltered world, what a happy, fun, sheltered world we live in nowadays, the, the, the actual awfulness. And so, like, when you write these books, you don't know what's going to happen. You're writing this stuff years in advance, right? right? You know, we're, we outlined this project years ago. And, uh, you know, the world catches up. And, and But you borrow from history. And you're, if you're a student of history and you write stuff both realistic for things that have happened in history, uh, it's funny, though, because people will read it, like, in a peaceful time and think, well, that's really, really, you know, out there. And then you read it in a time of war when that stuff is fresh in people's mind. You're like, oh, yeah, I guess this is the world. This is this is mankind. This is the kind of stuff we do to each other. Well, and that's I mean, there. And the other thing, too, is like a lot of this stuff you could not write today. Right. Without people. I mean, I'll give you an example. So on a previous episode, I, I interviewed uh, Norman Nymark, who's, a, a, you know, a, an expert on like Eastern European history in the kind of late or, or kind of mid 20th century. And we were talking about the Holodomor, right? And 
you know, he was just kind of going, and, and I'm just like, you know, I was like, Dr. Nymark, how bad was it? Like, really, how bad was it? Like cannibalism, this and that. And he's just like, oh, yeah, it was it was bad enough that um, people got like literally went crazy and ate their kids. And I'm like, did they like dig up the bodies and eat their kids? He's like, or and he's like, no, like they killed them and ate them. So that's dark. But that that kind of thing, but you know that that kind of thing happens. And there's there's stuff that I don't want to mention in in Bucha that is horrible in a different way, but but you know terrifying. Um, well, so you see that this makes it really hard to sell books. Yeah, yeah, Cause you're like, yeah. Because hey, hey guys, this is fun. You know, come read this book. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, I, you know, I, I said because. Cause like, I'm like, I'm more like Steve, like I, I can, I take, I can take things. Um, I, 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 I mean, so I have, I, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an anthology coming up called Robo Soldiers. And I have a story in there called Manchurian. And I created a CRISPR virus that the Chinese could literally create today, um, which, you know, it's a skin disease and it only targets non Han Chinese. And there's a, there's a distinct gene that people of Han Chinese descent have that the rest of the world doesn't. And, you know, I think there was some horror imprint that had to like went out of business because they published something about called the white plague or something like that. And it was just like, now I wouldn't ever recommend somebody call a project that because that's what's going to happen. But at the same time, people were like, it's impossible for people to do it. I'm like, no guys, it's called CRISPR. Like there are very distinct genes that you can trace this stuff to. Um, John Ringo used that in Troy Rising. Um, yeah, yeah, with the, the the aliens because they had watched the news and they decided which groups of humans were the most compliant, least compliant, and then designed uh, biological warfare based upon appearances of, well, of a, most news reporters. Well, the, and it's not even appearance. Like there's a book by um, Ken Alabek who. Abelek, I, I can't remember the exact name, but he was uh, he worked on the Soviet bio war warfare program, and the Soviets were looking at ways to disable the African American, or I guess it's black now, the black population in the U.S. Um, because they, uh, you know, at the time this is like the I guess maybe the '60s or '70s, were doing much of the manual labor and things like that, but they were focused on sickle cell anemia, right? Because it's a very distinct. Um, you know, malady that, that happens to, uh, that, you know, I mean, if you don't have the sickle cell anemia, if you have like the good, the good um, reflection of that gene, it makes you very re resistant to malaria. Right. Um, but, you know, the bottom line is there are, there are differences. And I mean, that we all look different because we have different, different genes that a nation state can target. And to say that that's just not possible is just ridiculous. But anyway, um, it's it's it starts out with a discussion of of Russian prison tattoos, and uh, what they what they mean, and kind of there's the looming threat of like um, rape, but like male rape, and you know it doesn't it doesn't come right out and say it, but there are certain tattoos that indicate certain things. Yeah, this uh, isn't for the record. This is not our book. This is somebody else's. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's not. Yeah, this is this. <laughs> Just yeah, want to clarify, is, as I'm already like scaring people away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, really Steve, Steve, you got to right? stop me. You got to stop me because I go dark. <clears throat> I go like I'll go like dark. Oh no, like that. No, you know, horror, horror is really interesting. You know, I, I used to I used to manage a bookstore, and um, horror and dark fantasy. You have to be really careful in how you pitch them to people because mm -hmm. um, a lot of these things. Once you're once you're in the book and you're reading it and you're involved in the story, a lot of this stuff tends to not matter in the context of the story anymore, right? Like it doesn't become dark enough to where you know it turns people off. But there are still some authors out there who will who will write really really dark stuff. Um, and the darker you get, the more you you kind of tend to limit your audience a little bit. Yep. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to horror, I'm very much a believer in that. Um, you know, I, I interviewed Robert McCammon a while back, who's who's one of my favorite authors ever. Um, and one of the things he said was um, one of the reasons why he writes horror is because to him it's fun. You know, and he he specifically said 
and, and I'll, I'll mangle the quote a little bit, but, um, you know, he was talking about vampires and werewolves and, and monsters and demons and all that stuff. And he's like, man, that's all the fun stuff. Um, he's like, that's fun stuff. you it's fictional. Your characters can deal with it. He's like, that's fun. He's like, he's like, and I write that because real world horror is so much worse than what mm-hmm. any of us can ever actually write. And so we write escapism horror to literally escape from all that, that super bad stuff. Um, and so that's, you know, that, that's a lot of what Larry and I did, um, in, in this, I mean, it's not like world war one was, uh, was all roses and, uh, in happy go fun jelly bean time. Like it was rough. It was bad. Um, and you know, the, the one guy who said, oh, there's not enough rats eating people in your fiction. We're like, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're not in this first book. We didn't tackle that. We were talking about heroes who were, who were in spite of their horrible, terrible, um, oppressive government and the horrible, terrible fairy creatures and the horrible, terrible, um, goddesses who are ruling the world. Um, they're out there doing good heroic things because for the most part, they're good people. Um, and, and I learned that from, from uh, another horror guy named Joe Lansdale, who everyone knows about. And that's, and that's look as dark as you're going to get in your fiction. You need to make sure you put points of light in there and in heroic pieces in there to offset it and to give people the realistic expectations that look, yeah, bad stuff's going to happen, but good can triumph. doesn't mean it will, but it can. Yeah. And your, your, your heroes have to have a chance to to win right um well and and that's the kind of characters that both larry and i like to write um i i like to get a little bit more dark and twisty than larry does um but my i'm a horror guy to, my job was to talk steve off the off the off the crazy wall but... <laughs> yeah there there, there were if, there were a few scenes where larry's like now yeah, steve we don't want to scare everyone in the entire universe let's well, pull I mean, that step there was some uh, involving because we have one character who's a secret policeman and he's just a scumbag, but he's one of the main characters. And uh, and, and Steve has him do some stuff pretty early on. I was like, nah, dude, that's too far because we want to get to the point where the, where the readers will be able to root for this guy a little bit, you know, because yeah. he, he's against things that are worse than him. Mm-hmm. We can't go that far, you know, and it's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> well, you know? And that's, what, that's what's hard. Like you can't, um, like the full range of human, because the other thing too is, um, the same person can do absolutely atrocious things, but at the same time, walk, you know, walk a, a granny across the street. Yeah. Right. Well, so that's one of the things. So what we did in this is we made sure like our, so our main character, uh, we've had people talk about the reviews is like, what's well, kind of tropey. It's like, you know, the, the farm boy made good chosen one becomes a hero kind of thing. But we did that on purpose because, you know, stories need heroes. Uh, people mm-hmm. need, need that heroic, uh, that dude who is legit good, who will honestly try to do the right thing no matter what uh, the situation. And so we did this really awful crap sack world, but we put this guy in it who is the best of us. He is actually a, a good guy trying to do the right thing. And um, I don't know. It, it, there's, so I mean, it was a lot of fun. And the action sequences of being able to have uh, basically – Imagine like a tank crew, only instead of a tank, they have this big armored suit made out of you know dead golems powered by you know broken golem magic. So it's a big armored kind of steampunk suit. There's one driver, uh, and then the rest of the crew clears the way for the for this walking suit. Uh, they're called objects, and uh, and so they're they're clearing the way for the object. And what happens is the way the magic works: the more magic is used, the more damage it takes. The 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 cost is heat. And so the magic produces heat. So the driver is getting cooked the whole time. <laughs> and so what happens is that they run these like they're supposed to have like twelve man crews, but the nature of war they have like five is what they actually get. And so as the suit overheats, they stop it, pop the hatch, pull the poor half dead guy out, throw in buckets of water, reload the guns, and throw another dude in. And and then they just cycle it and nonstop is the battle sequences. And so our guy is this rookie, and so he goes through battle, and so so he's clearing debris. They're clumsy too, you know. And yeah. They're not. They're not. So he's out there. They're in the mud. His most. They don't even get guns. The crewmen don't get guns. They get shovels, pry bars, chains, hooks, and so he's out ahead of this, you know, walking golem suit with a shovel 
looking for things for it to trip over while it's getting shot at. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, so the action sequences in this book are fantastic. I I had a lot of fun with those. Those were great. Yeah, uh, really, really I mean, cool. we we tried. To, I mean, look, Larry's known for action, right? I mean, That's there's right. not a that, single that, person. Thing. There's not a single person on the planet who reads a Larry book and doesn't, and at the end, doesn't go, "Dang!" Like, like if only Larry could write action. Like, no one says that, right? Right. Right. Um, so, so taking Larry's propensity for action, um, and and the clearness in which he writes the action, and the um, and with the skill he does so, but then injecting some some horror sensibilities that I tend to have, um, it made for a very a very different feeling book. For, for a lot of people. Um, and for the most part, I mean, I mean, for the, the, the gross most part, um, people seem to be really digging it right now. Yeah. Um, they, they really like kind of the, the amped up stakes that the horror is adding into this really cool fantasy world. Well, the, and we went Eastern European on this cause there's a lot of really groovy folklore to, to yeah. draw from. And a lot of different cultures. And so we actually have like a, we have a, a Roman, a Roman character. We have gypsies, we have wanderers. Uh, and so we had this whole big giant section of the book where, well, not giant section, but like, so we have this one main character we follow around is, uh, is uh, drafted because uh, this army drafts foreigners basically. And they hold your, they hold your family uh, basically in a, as uh, political prisoners, basically until you serve your term. Uh, and then, then, then you're free to go. And so there's this one uh, Romany sniper, uh, because the way the magic system works, you know, I, I don't, I don't give too much away, but it's pretty baller. Uh, she's blessed by the yeah. goddess of the hunt. We'll just put it that way. She kills a lot of dudes. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we have this whole big, great, big thing where there's fortune telling, you know, uh, with the because these guys are running the suits, they get burned. They all have third degree burns on parts of their mm-hmm. body because the suits get hot when they get damaged. And so they have this tattoo artist that basically follows them around, follows this one unit around, and does tattoos over the burn scars and those like basically tell the future how they're blessed by the gods or whatever. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know, it was a great setting. We were able to draw from a lot of cultural things and they had a lot of fun. And, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it came out pretty dang cool. I'm really, I'm really digging yeah. this setting. It's, it was, it was, a, it was a hoot. Uh, just, I have to ask this question because you, you in, kind of triggered it earlier on, Larry, if, these crews as they're digging a path and clearing obstacles. What if one of these, these suits trips? <laughs> oh, oh no, we go into that. Like the biggest danger in the world is the suit falling over. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we get into actually why they're man shaped too, because it's where the golem magic comes from. And, uh, but they're very clumsy. Right. And uh, so there, there's one dude is inside driving this thing. This is kind of walking along powered by magic. Um, but the most dangerous thing in the world is if they fall, because if they trip and they fall forward, the hatches in the back, you can still escape. But if it trips and falls backwards into like mud, you can literally have the pilot drown yeah. before yeah. they can get the thousands of pounds of metal rolled over to get the guy out. And the reason they have the suits on them, because they all have, they have like basically a magical aura around them that protects them. So as bullets is hitting it, it's just translating into heat. But it also keeps the crew immediately around and behind and protected. So they always advance as a line. And so if one gets farther forward or back or gets stuck, it's a hole in the wall. Now it's a gap that can be exploded, and that's when people start to die. And yeah, um, the, the the whole idea behind this group is that you know, these pseudo Russians, right? They're they're not as technologically advanced as their enemies, but they have this this magic with these suits. And that that gives them it doesn't really give them an edge, which is why they're they're effectively at a stalemate. They're fighting over trenches that have been taken and lost and retaken, you know, dozens of times, hundreds of times over the course of a hundred years. And so they're the Almatians, which are the, the opposite side of this war, their guns have better range. They're they're more technologically advanced. They're better at chemical warfare. But the you know, the the Kolokovians. They have these giant golems that effectively form more or less an impenetrable wall. And so it's this whole give and take. And it, it lent itself really cool and really well to kind of the whole the whole trench warfare aspect of the of the story and of the war they're all going through. One is a grinder and, and yeah. we meet we meet some of the leadership of this people. 
<laughs> and they're horrible. <laughs> they're so freaking awful. And they just spin lives like like whatever. It was like, oh, we, yeah. Yeah, we just, get more just another currency. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a currency to spin. We actually we talked about that in the book. Mm. And they just spin these, you know. And uh it's it's brutal. And uh the, it so- sounds the familiar. Is, sounds familiar. Yeah. Actually, so as, as far as as far as like guessing the future as far as the accuracy, we were spot friggin' on. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, that's why we that's why we, you know it's, it's like it's like if you're writing Slavic stuff, anything based on the Slavic world, you can't go wrong just uh uh ever you know overestimating man's inhumanity to man. But uh no, so I, I keep saying all this stuff, but I want people to buy the book because it is actually good. It's a, the book is fun. Yeah. Uh, it's an enjoyable read. It's like it's like, but just it's like we talk about it in context. It's like, wow, that sounds horrific. I don't want to read that. Um, I no, think it actually, sounds amazing. <laughs> it's pretty baller, actually. Um, okay, so like talk about the, the the suits. So so the main character is, is very gifted at this, and we'll, we get into that mm-hmm. too. Like as, as, as the plot is revealed, the, the kid is really good. Uh, and so he's basically an ace pilot right out the gate. Um, but like their final testing thing. So they're running these guys through the things or stuff like they have these, all the, all the recruits lineup and all the recruits are huge because the suits are so big and so heavy. Everybody in this unit has to basically be strong as a friggin' ox. And also the, they're sized for very large people. So like, like the shortest dude in this unit is like six foot one, right? Uh, they're all big, big, strong guys. Um, but like the final test thing, I don't want to give too much away, but it's like it comes down to like all these big, strong, powerful dudes driving these big monster suits. The final test is they have to like do something very delicate with the suit. <laughs> right. It's also really horrible if they mess up. <laughs> I don't want to give give too much away. Um, no, but it's it's uh, the battle sequences are cool too. Then I got to have a little fun with the gun design uh, yeah. and basically like how you would run a repeating repeating cannon from inside a suit. Um, and it's basically just like, so you disconnect your arm and you work this, you work the action inside the, inside the, the arm sleeve. And it's just dropping these like, you know, 20 millimeter shells out of the bottom. It's just hopper fed. Oh man. <laughs> just, and so guys are running up during these battles and they have these stripper clips and they're like feeding stripper clips into the top of the hoppers. Um, while trying not to get killed. Shot. Well, cause, right. uh, most people, unless they're magic gift, can't see the aura around the 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 mech you know i said mech but the golem and so if they get outside of that they can't see it and so yeah, there's bullets it. whizzing all around cannon shells exploding and if they step outside of that magical aura that's fluctuating boom they're just bah, they're dead you know you guys getting hit and they can't waste anything because they're so friggin' poor mm-hmm. <laughs> they got no food um and they're just it, oh yeah yeah, it's yeah. It's we 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 delved, you know. Larry and I talk about this sort of thing a lot on the on the podcast that he and I do, Writer Dojo. And we we talk about when when you're creating a world and, and fantasy stuff, like like you're you're tempted just to talk about like oh magic, but you know there's a lot more. There's other important things too: economics, how everything influences itself within the world. And so you know we we delve into a little bit of that in here. You know, we, we talk about the the horrible rationing that these people are going through. Um, you know, the the idea of propaganda that, mm-hmm. that the people see within this world on just this side of the of the war. You know, one of the earlier one of the earlier scenes in the book, the main character he he goes from being out in the middle of nowhere, just a farm life, simple farm life, loving life, doing good, and then everything dies. And then he uh, and then he goes to the main city that he's heard so much about, but he's never visited. And as he's as he's rolling into town, he becomes, you know, minute by minute, mile by mile, as he's getting in, he becomes more and more disillusioned because he sees that the reality is not um, is not what he re- what he was told it was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he sees he sees the ration lines, he sees he sees the the overreach of secret police, he sees all these things, and yet this goddess has basically voluntold him. That, that he has to go, you know, be part of this military. Well, and then he gets as part of the military and he's like, oh crap. Like, here's your here's your outfit. It's mostly new. Most of the blood's <laughs> been scrubbed out of it. So here you right. go, buddy. Yeah. There's I a thought. bullet there's a bullet hole in the coat. 
<laughs> you know, right out the gate. It's like, oh, here you go. Oh man, and then like so, like the farmer that gives me a ride into town is bringing a bringing a load of load of uh, crops, and right off the bat has to pay like a seventy percent tax rate. You know, yeah, pay this fair share. <laughs> Yeah, have you ever asked anybody what 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 their fair, what what fair share means? Oh, it's exactly nothing for them and lots for me. I'm sure that's how it usually yes. works out. It's whatever. It's whatever doesn't. It's whatever I'm jealous of. Um, <laughs> that that's fair share. Yep. But you know, I mean, gosh, and, and we yeah, have back even, to the book, sir. <laughs> I I, no, I, oh, I can go off on taxes. Oh yeah, I I just. I just paid a crud ton of taxes, so I'm so sure. You're talking, right to two, you're talking to two accountants, former accountant, yeah. current accountant. We can, we'll go off. Yeah, we <laughs> we hate we hate taxes, but you know, yeah, I just, look, I just wrote a big the, check the too. Cool thing, I'm not happy about it. Yeah. The the interesting thing is we haven't even touched the opposite side of this war, and there's a scene that Larry and I are dying to write. You know where where these main characters who have only known shortage and and rationing and you know horrible terribleness i mean their country just barely got electricity like they're they're a mess and then there's but, the germans but to have them <laughs> but but then to have those same people go somewhere else you know to to draw upon some of those you know the the real world takes of you know people who've been in those situations who go into a to a stocked supermarket for the first time and they're like mm-hmm. holy crap this is paradise you, you mean I can just go buy bread? I don't have to wait in line. Like, well, oh. well that's actual kind of, Russians, that's kind of actual crazy. Russians just steal it. But well, yeah. <laughs> well, you got plenty of but there's, got plenty of theft. Sorry, sorry I shouldn't so, say I, should, I shouldn't generalize like that. But um, but by the way, this is just a quick aside. You know how they uh, Russian soldiers stole a bunch of uh, like Maytag uh, appliances and stuff like that, and they mailed it home to from from Belarus. Well, it turns out, it turns out that the uh, Russian Postal Service uh, or employees from the Russian per- Postal Service looted their loot, apparently. <laughs> so, anyway, go ahead. back to the book. Back to, back to the book. Uh, I can't imagine uh, why this these, whole time why the tanks have run out of fuel. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a mystery. Oh man! Hey, I, I lived in Mexico for a year, so you know I get it. Like. Like no matter what's mailed to you, you just assume that everything that was mailed to you is only about half of, of what was actually mailed. Like what you got was only half. So yep. I get it. I've been there. Uh, you know, lived in a third world. Um, but no, nah, man, Russia's I mean, not supposed to be a third world. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it basically is. Okay, so so all, uh, the um, Almatians. Mm-hmm. You were talking about the Almatians. Sorry, I'm trying to get oh, into the they're... stereotypes of Teutons, humorless Teutons. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, no, no, uh, no superstition. You know, they're just they're just completely logic based and they're they're all about furthering science and technology. Um, they have their own goddess, of course. And in the whole the whole underlying concept here is that all of these nations are just being toys for for several goddesses who are just trying to kill each other. Yeah, we didn't um, say what the the cosmology was, but what it is is there's basically there was three three goddesses that ruled this world when mankind showed up, and each one picked a tribe to be like their favorites, and they were the ones that like suit them. So the ones over the Kolokobi is basically the Baba Yaga. It's like this old, yeah. the old witch of the woods is what it like is. The, like the house with the chicken legs or whatever. Yo, Absolutely. Straight up the house straight up. with the chicken legs. Uh, uh, you know, like the whole eating children thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's Oh, that's, you guys go there. You guys go there, huh? Oh, yeah. That's, we, yeah, okay. we, we definitely hint at it um, through in one specific scene. She's it's actually who, more effective if you hint, I think. She's, yeah. who, she's who orders this guy. She's who orders the hero to go to war. <laughs> And so, so you can see, like they said, it's not the good guys. Well, then so we don't really get the Almatian sister too much. But then there's a third sister who the other sisters gang up and murder thousands of years ago. And so she's, she's dead, and she's still very angry about that. And so like the, that we don't, the last part of the book is they take a, they take a trip through hell. They, they, do a, they do a ruck march through hell briefly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so 
I don't want to give too much away, but we have a cosmology. And also it's interesting too, because all the humans that came over and brought our religions with us of the various times. So there's like various pagans, and then there's also the Christians. Christians came mm-hmm. over, and we also have one group of Jews. And um, so the Christianity we have in this world is kind of like a bastardized version of like, uh, it's like sort of Orthodox Christian mixed with like this bizarre with the sisters uh, are, are kind of like above the saints, but not. And the sisters really are calling the shots on this side, but yeah. So it's we've got some weird religious stuff going on. It's pretty. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it, in, in a world, in a world, in a <laughs> world where um, you know different different groups are coming from different areas and and stuff, and they're all kind of mishmashing. Likewise, the cosmology starts to mishmash. I mean, you have these sisters, you have a Christianity thing. The, the the female sniper that's in it has her own cosmology that she worships and that she's blessed by. Um, and none of these gods are happy about the other gods. And so, you know, it's, you know, it, it's just a giant, giant cluster for, for our poor, poor characters. And so, um, you know, most of the time they're just trying to survive the craziness that they're in um, and find some solace in each other. But man, Man, some of these characters, man, we just there, there's four main POV characters in the book, and yeah. man, we love them. They're so fun, and um, we abuse them. Oh, we abuse the crap out of. <laughs> we them. abuse them because um, we love them. Yeah, you know, and and one of them is basically a villain, and he would be the main villain in the story if not for other bigger, badder villains that happen to be there. Yeah, and so yeah, you think this guy is like the worst, and then you meet his boss. Yeah. And he looks and he, and he looks small potatoes compared to his boss. Well, yeah, cuz like so the so the main character is like the guy who runs the empire. Basically his his overall plan is I want to invade hell uh to steal the souls of the damned to power my empire. Yeah. That's like his goal. <laughs> that's like his mission statement. <laughs> and that's the boss, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's why might be, he actually might be Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Apologies for the abrupt ending, but that was about the only logical segue I could make to the next topic. So stay tuned, and uh, I look forward to sharing the next episode with you of Larry Korea and Steve Diamond. And the next episode, we're going to be talking about my perennial topic that I always talk about, which is the Russia-Ukraine situation. I know we already covered it uh, an episode ago, but we're going to cover it again because uh, Larry and I and Steve just kept coming back. So, sorry. Uh, anyway, it's a fun, it's a fun discussion on an unfortunately very serious topic, and I think continuing to cover it is is important because one way or another we might get increasingly involved as a a country so the better the ukrainians do the more unlikely it will be that our country needs to get involved in this conflict so stay tuned and thank you for following if you enjoyed this video hit like and subscribe and i'll see you next time